Welcome back. Johnny and Yusuf from Propen Fitness are here again. Today, we are going to discuss how to survive university. How many degrees have we got between us? One and a... a you're a chartered accountant. An ACA. Yeah. One and a... You're now a Bachelor of Medicine. Oh, yeah, true. Well, I'm, I'm a, a... Is it a health science diploma that you get after halfway through? And then... So one one point five. You're the only one that knows. Don't yeah, ask uh, okay. <laughs> you've got you've got kind of two. I've got two. So there's five degrees between us and like cumulative amount of like what? How have you got two? When did you sneak masters. a second one in? Oh, I've done a masters. Right, okay. Ma- masters. 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 So we've been at uni for like what? Twelve years between us. Time. Something like that. Yeah. yeah. Bare yeah. time, bro. Made Bare every time. possible mistake that you yeah. can make at university. Been waste man. Been super productive and everything in between. I mm, so. resat a year at uni. Did you? Yeah. What for? I would have never guessed that. So, well, that's part of what I want to talk about. Fantastic. Went just basically came out of first year hard with momentum. Went into second year <laughs> with with same momentum. Stiffy. And then about a third of the way through, thought, "Fuck," and then failed to. <laughs> <laughs> Shit. <laughs> well, so we've got a lot to get through today. Um, for those of you who don't know what I do. I'm a club promoter, and for the last 12 years or so, in one form or another, I have had to look after freshers. They are usually the money makers for us in terms of guest listers. So what that means is that every year I get one year older, but the age of the people who work for me and the situations that they encounter mm. pretty much stay the same. It's just faces and names that change. Just the diverges. Yeah. Does that make just, you feel just to be clear, more the, old? Those people than- also do get older is what Chris is saying is that he's working with different people yeah, they're, they're not frozen so it has in the time. perception that they are getting older <laughs> yeah, I'm, Chris is okay aware of that. I am what I'm right. saying is that although they are not frozen in time I see a snapshot of them <laughs> while I continue to age and then there's there's a picture of them all that's in the attic of a dusty house and if they look at the picture of themselves then they catch up all of the years that have gone by and then yeah <clears throat> and that's it so yeah I thought one of the things that we all know pretty well is how to fuck up at university and what and common... To, and to prosper. And, well, the thing is, while I was at university, I really did... I prospered outside of uni, mm. but I was categorically shite at university. The fact that I got a 2-1 and then a merit in a master's is... Really, it's a, it's a miracle. So I think that means, actually, that you've mastered university, honestly. Mm, because it was kind of seamless. Well, like, you're there for experience and your degree is part of that experience but if you just get a degree what a waste of time yeah for an expensive waste of time good point so what do we want to start with surviving freshers week is probably a pretty good place to start can you remember your first freshers week uh yeah what happened did you do anything funny just i just remember total total overwhelm yeah that that experience overwhelm Overwhelm. find overwhelm Overwhelm. where's the overwhelm i cannot see it so i think don't don't (laughs) I literally just hands behind your back, kamikaze headband on, and just go. Hope for the best. Don't do that. No, that is what to do. do Yeah, you need to go with the alcohol. Just just with with everything. everything. Yeah, I think there are there are lots of things to consume. Consume all of them in as much as you possibly can. Just a week, isn't it? So yeah, just yeah. Dive right in. How how were your freshers week? Because when you did your first (laughs) freshers week, you would have still been Muslimic. Yeah, so that that's an interesting point actually. So I, for anyone who doesn't know, I've done two degrees. One in maths and business, 2008 to 2012. Another one in um, 2013, 14, up until now. During which time I had a a crisis of faith. <laughs> um, and I mean, I, I've, I've never he drunk. Ate a, he ate a sausage, basically. <laughs> he ate a sausage and it I just stealthing that one another. <laughs> it's a very slippery sausage and went down the... Uh, the wrong tube. The slope of, <laughs> of carefers. So... <laughs> Um, first freshers week, pretty sensible. Second freshers week, you're five, six years older and you're like, oh man, I'm too old for this. Like, even though 23, 24 is not really like super old, but it, you realize the differential between having to do that with a bunch of 18 year olds and you can, you can smell the like pulsating insecurity and, um, this, it's a surge of seeking approval because you've taken someone who is in that stage of their life along with a lot of alcohol, new people, new environment, and it just creates this cocktail of um, desperation. It's a very, a, a, there's an awful, <clears throat> like a Velcro level grasping for some sense of... 
assurance so, and, mm. and centering. So this it's is like, why people like hook on to like the people in their <clears> corridor <throat> or like the first person they meet, they just become instant best mates with. And if you just only hang around with the people in your corridor or, or whatever, then you get this misplaced sense of loyalty because you, you're well, tribal, right? I, so I said this on the social, social chain podcast. If you don't play a sport and don't have a really tight hobby that is going to immediately give you some sense of first identity and then second community with people at uni, what are you bonding with other people over? The people in your course, apart from the fact that they've also chosen to do your course, have in no way been discriminated to your interests or your mindset. This is... <clears throat> so here's my first tip for surviving university. Surprise, surprise. Work for an events company. <laughs> <laughs> because... Oh, here it is. Yeah, this entire thing was a huge <laughs> fucking affiliate scheme. No, here's the reason here's my justification for why I think you should work for an events company first off it gives you support structure of people that are older than you that understand the city they can tell you where's good to go for food where you should go on a night out you'll get to know a bunch of people if you're into partying and if you like to go out and drink you're immediately going to get a family of 200 to 400 other people all of whom have got similar interests they're at the same university you've got a manager who'll look after you the whole time you get free entry to nightclubs you get discounted drinks you get the family that you need at university and it's a fantastic support structure that is quite a good point because otherwise like the the alternative is like if you don't expose yourself to a wide range of people straight away is that you end up like so narrowing your slice of people that you experience and withdrawing into just you know this, this happens every single time because i've seen so many freshers come through as well where it's just like they only hang around with the first four people that they meet mm -hmm. and then that's it and the f first four people may not be com may not be good for them anything that you know, overlaps with them apart from the only thing they have in common is that they both were equally desperate to hang on to someone yeah, yeah. and then they end up living with them for the following five years and yeah man um so widening the net of the people that you can reach is a good idea so things that I think going into freshers, well, let's go through it year by year. So going into freshers, I think it's such a cliche and everybody says it, but like your grades do not matter. If you get 40%, that is all that matters. And I even like everyone is like, oh, well, you know, I know that you only need 40%, but like I should. No, <clears throat> for me at university, there is a, quite a long period of time, probably six months to 12 months where you just need to completely let loose. It's the first time you've been away from home from your parents. You've got absolute liberation mm. from all of the previous <clears throat> confines that you used to have. And I think if you don't take advantage of it in your first year, the fear is that that then surfaces in second or third year when it does matter. So bin yourself. I would advise absolutely. as much damage as possible uh, yeah. to yourself in the first year. I can, is that I why can... you're saying throw yourself in to the first year? What do you mean? Because you said that you, you went, you kind of spread out the decadence. Oh, no, no. I just didn't stop. <laughs> I yeah. see. Very different problem. So I, I can really clearly remember. Um, so one of the first times I met Dan, Dan. Broad, Broadcast Gibson, he ha just happened to be, we went to the same school, but we weren't that friendly at school. He happened to be in the, the, the flat next to me. We're on the same course. And I remember both of us at one point having this conversation that we were like, we'd missed the library tutorial because we were, th there was something happening alcohol related. We just didn't go to anything. Like, I didn't go to anything for like the first six months at all. <laughs> Cause because this would have been before like smart card check-ins and stuff now. Yeah. Mm. So like there was a whole, the, the library was actually quite complicated. <coughs> and so I didn't get a book out at uni until third year, your third year final didn't know exams how to. because I didn't know how to, but I remember being really stressed about it at the time thinking like I'm fucking uni. That's I can't, impressive. I can't believe I'm already fucking uni. Like it's 10 days in. But, like, nothing happened. You didn't get it's, a book out until the final year exams? No. I didn't get a book out ever. It was all on Seriously, the, it was all on never the, got a book the portal. Not even in my like, master's. Never got a book out once. You the only too. time I did get a book out was <laughs> I had to intimidate a Chinese lady who was standing at the photocopy with it. And, and then I <laughs> what do you took, want? <laughs> took the book, went home, went back to Newcastle and stomached a £10 a day fine because I was so worried <laughs> I was going to fail the exam. £10 a day. Wow. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think... So, yeah, don't worry about all that. Like, don't worry about intro lectures and library tutorials and... There's, like, there's maybe a bit... How many days did you have it for? Uh, Would it have been cheaper to buy the book? So you couldn't buy the book? Uh, okay. That's fine. So I think go <clears throat> dick and balls, full length and testicles on 
First year. Because I think actually the worst thing that can happen after uni is that you regret how you spent your time there. Mm. And I don't think you're ever going to look back. As long as it doesn't impinge on your degree, yeah. you're never going to look back and think, God, I partied far too much in first year. For a lot of people, obviously we're coming at this from the side of a group that are either still at university or have relative amounts of freedom to do what they want because we work for ourselves. Mm. A lot of people are going to go into a much more bureaucratic organisation and their final bastion of freedom is their time at uni. Yep. And I can imagine that if I feel like this, <laughs> for someone who doesn't have that same level of freedom once they get into a proper working routine, yeah, man, it, yeah. must be, it must be even worse. Well, and that, you, I experienced that. Well, people living for the weekend once they well, get yeah, to Well, it. that's just all that happens. It's a hangover. Yeah. It's oddly a hangover of not drinking enough and partying enough at uni. So first tip is go dick and balls during your first year. Remember that the 40% grade that you need, <clears throat> that's it. Once you've hit 41%, it doesn't matter you after passed. that. Yeah. Now, I think For it's most, a, that's probably not the same with you though, is it? It's, it's not, but um, I've, I've heard people, well, I've seen people mess up by saying like, oh, I only need to pass 40%. So I'm just going to learn 40% of the course. I'm like, mm, mm, no, because then you need to learn works. 100% of the 40%. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that's actually a, a terrible idea. Um, and even but, then, it it's, still might not work. Yeah, very, very risky. If anyone's but, taken what I mean as get a 40% grade as learn 40% of the course, they deserve to fail. Fine. So your your first tip comes from a place of get it out of your system. Don't have any lingering sense of like, oh, I didn't quite squeeze the lemon there and I'm just going to spend the rest of my life trying to catch up in the weekends yeah. mm-hmm. for partying. I think okay. it's not just, not even just that. It's just that especially when you first arrive at university, for me, what you should be trying to do is get as much of a broad cross-section of experiences and exposure to people as you can. Remembering, I know that you go to university at 18 and you think that you understand how the world works, but I'm telling you as someone who's 30 years old, you don't even have the first clue. Mm -hmm. Like I look at the boys that work for us now, the managers who I'm closest with, and then the girls as well who are the guest listers and stuff below them and some of our hostesses, et cetera, et cetera. And they're so much further ahead than I was at their age. Like so much more mature. I think that exposure to the internet means that people are able to grow up and be exposed to different people more quickly. And yet they're still like broadly like children. Mm. Like they're children who can legally drink, drive and vote. (laughs) That's exactly what David said. I, as I was leaving the house, I was like, David, what are you, what's your survival tip for university? And he was like, you're going to be shit the whole time, but you're going to think that you're awesome. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, there you go. He's, exactly he's right, though. He's definitely right. So I think be, be aware <laughs> of the fact that it's a learning process in all areas of your life. And don't try and take, I think, don't try and take anything too seriously. Mm. I certainly thought that I wasn't prepared to mess up. Because I was like, oh, I'm at university, there's all this pressure on me. I'm supposed to be this adult who's living on his own, who's supposed to have his life sorted out. Like, 12 years later, still not got my life sorted mm-hmm. out. Still mess up all the time. So don't think that that's something that you need to do. There was a, there was a, a really clear moment for me about three months in. I'm really sharing my darkest moments here. So I'm sat in the corner of my room because there was nowhere else to sit because there was just mess all over the floor. <laughs> And I was eating a cold pot noodle, sat perched in the corner, eating this cold pot noodle. And I just looked at my room and I thought, I've got to do something about this. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't think, I, like I sort of slowly did, mm. but I, I just, I really felt like I, apart from the gym, I just let go of everything else in my life. <laughs> I was just like, right, I'm just going to absolutely, I just felt like I was in a playground. Mm. And just go to town. And maybe that's not the right way to go about it, but I definitely don't look back at that and think that was stupid. Yeah. I think um, a good a good thing to do is potentially try and join a sports team or a society. Yeah. I wish that I had doubled down more on the opportunity to play sports. <laughs> Reason for that is, like, when you get to 25 or 30, like, going, I'm going to start rowing. Mm. Like, no, you're not. No, you're not going time to start. Pass, you're it? not going to start rowing. But at uni, this is a time to try new things. So go, like... I remember thinking Ultimate Frisbee was like weird. And I'm, now mm. I think, if you give me the opportunity to try <laughs> Ultimate Frisbee for yeah. a day, you're like, absolutely. Fucking yes. rights would yeah. I go and do Ultimate Frisbee. So I think try as many different societies, sports and societies as you can. Um, I'd like to segue onto you, Yusuf, about trying to get some low hanging fruit for studying tactics. So I think <laughs> so, the one thing that I had, like, 
you can't off, completely write off your entire first year mm. as it being a waste. But <clears throat> one of the things that you should do is begin to grease the groove of at least understanding how to study effectively. So, yeah, I'll, I've got it. So I, I've split my notes up into this different sections. So before we move on to study, just the final thing on um, Freshers' Week and this desperation for approval and people latching onto each other is an example that I saw of a guy second time round with my Freshers' Week, second degree, who was, he was 18. He was called, um, I'm not going to say his name, actually. But, <laughs> um, but he was national insurance number. <laughs> but he was a Muslim guy and he was drinking and I was chatting to him about his Muslim family, I was like, do your family know that you drink? Oh, no, no, it's, that's actually the f- first time. Like, oh, how come you're drinking? He was like, oh, just, you know, it's fresh as week and I, I have to because of the pressure. I'm like, do you even like it? He was like, no. I'm like, well, don't just, like, completely compromise on who you are for the sake of approval. Don't yeah. just, like, do this because you think that's what you're supposed to do. And I was like, look, I, I, I took it out of his hand. And I was like, just be you. Don't Don't try and... Because this is the slippery slope. This is the time when if you make that one compromise now, that's it. Like There's numerous ones that are going to then. It's a good point. <clears throat> if people are, are doing that, Muslim or not, in in loads of ways in French like, If you like it, yeah. go ahead. Yeah. Like, But the fact that you're saying you don't even like doing this, but... Well, I did loads yeah. of stuff. I did loads of stuff that I thought that I, I thought I liked at the time. Like I was going out all the time and I very quickly realised that for me, I was much more interested in developing my business. Like I want to spend time developing my business, but because all of my flatmates weren't like that, I'm like, you feel oh, like a weirdo. Yeah, I ate loads of Pizza Hut. Didn't realize I like Domino's better. There you go. Yeah. That's it. Again. Like I remember eating loads of Pizza Hut, thinking this is this is the obviously. Right. in the corner of the room. Loads of Pizza Hut boxes. Like, I'm like, studying. Oh, this I'm like, I don't even like Pizza Hut. <laughs> studying. Yeah. Studying. So with studying, the the best way to go about this is not to think, oh. I don't need to go to lectures. No one's checking up on me here. This is great. I can, hey, I can just like mm. do start working a week before the exam. Just if you really want a good degree, like if you're there to get a degree and to get a good grade, treat it like a day job. You're the one that's the master of your own time then. And I guarantee if you treat it like that, there is no way you'll get anything less than a first if you just treat it as like a nine to five during the day. Same way as when you, with you, when you were doing A-levels, you didn't, you couldn't go home during the day. You just turned up, did the work, came home, maybe did a bit of homework, but you don't even need to do that. Set yourself a really hard rule of no Xbox during the day, no nonsense before <laughs> 4 p.m. Doesn't even have to be a full nine till five. And once you've done that, your evenings are fully free. There's no guilt. You The fun stuff tends to happen in the evenings anyway. And then you're a free agent. Is this in, fresh, is this in first year? First year, like, it depends how scared you are of failing. Like, I think, as as you said, Chris, like, people are often, you get two types of people, the neurotic ones that are too afraid of failing. And ironically, they're the ones that need to pull back a bit. And mm-hmm. then the ones who think, like, oh, I'll be fine. And they're the ones that fail. So you, you almost have to look at your own track record and say, have a bit of self-awareness to say, am I someone who is legitimately at risk of failing? Or mm. am I just... It's very difficult concerned? at a young age to work out that sort of a thing, though, isn't it? Because Cambridge suicides are the high... Like, the people who commit suicide at Cambridge are the highest performers because they're the ones that have the most neurotic fear that they're going to fail or that's that they're crazy. not living up to their... <clears throat> that's, a, that's a terrifying statistic. <clears throat> I think is. I think what, what I would say is I had a very well-established uh, revision um, ritual, which was I'd identically learn everything on a page. So I'd write out my notes for the exam. I would summarise the entire module write out notes for the exam and then just learn it verbatim. So I could then, I wouldn't, I could even remember when looking on the page, oh, there's that top left hand, but okay, so I'm learning about something to do with the counting. Okay, what are the four principles so of accounting? you have a summary page and then you, you just <clears throat> I would have it. a summary eight pages mm-hmm. and I would learn them verbatim, like allow myself to read until a bit, read a new bit, close the page, try and remember it. If I could remember it, go back, learn another bit and just compound it on top. That's what the guy in your learning podcast says. Learning to says, learn. But he, he does, but he talks about, he doesn't talk about doing it as verbatim because what the problem I came across from doing that was that I had a glass ceiling and box and sides on <laughs> everything I knew because if it was... If it wasn't on your notes, then it's it was, <laughs> well, I'm fucked because I interpretively I had nothing. But for courses like business, accounting, 
like there's no creativity required. Mm. You don't need to be creative with your answer. So I think that strategy works extremely well when there is a finite curriculum and it's like, if you learn that stuff in these summary notes, you've got enough. If you're doing philosophy or classics. Then you, you then you need to read like, and the, those, those degrees are, that's why they say like, what are you reading? You know, it's like at university, it's like the, you do have, there's no way around that, but you end up with a lot more depth of knowledge as a result and you can interpret. And so, yeah, the, the guy, the, the main thing that, jumped out me from your podcast about learning was the guy saying learning and memorization is repeated recall, not repeated exposure to the material. Mm -hmm. And loads of people, they just like reread their notes loads of times and highlight. And it's like, then you just create the familiarity fallacy, familiarity Mm -hmm. paradox where like you look at you like, Oh yeah, yeah, I know that. That's fine. That's fine. Close the book. See if you can tell me it. Yeah. And you're like, Oh, No. <clears throat> so that's good. That's good for studying. Um, I think relationships. So I've I've wanted for studying. Hit me. So something that I wish I'd done. So I feel like uni is the biggest example of Parkinson's law for most people. So it depends on the type of degree you do. But can like, you explain Parkinson's law, please? So you take as long to complete something as you allocate to that task. So if you say I've got, it's the epitome of uni. It is. <laughs> it is. So like you come out of school where you're given day structures, lessons, homework. You're basically a, a map between starting point and end point is, is built for you. With the little the little checkpoints checkpoint along the way. You dropped into uni and someone says, right, here you are for three or four years. You have to get a degree at the end of it. You don't even need to turn up. So you you don't even need to turn up. Like if, if you don't turn up, we'll send you the we'll send you the odd like stiff so on the wrist. Word email. Yeah. But that, that's it. So mo- what I did certainly in certainly first and second year was you'd wait until I, I wait until like three weeks before the exams and then like, Oh my God, there's all these lectures to go through. Mm-hmm. If I had done 30 minutes of work a day, the entire time I was there mm-hmm. and kept on top of like lecture today, like what were the key points? Can I understand them? Can I explain them? Forget about it. Live well, the rest of my life. How many people so, that, are, that have been to university that are listening now or at university now, or even that have done A levels or GCSEs, left the revision until the night before. Yeah, that's me all over. Yeah. Parkinson's law, work expands to fill the time given for it. And exactly. that's the reason why people do it beforehand. I think it's very telling of people's personality types. My business partner, Darren, very, very procedural, likes to schedule things in. He would have finished his... He, I don't think I ever saw him finish an assignment and he did the same course as me later than like the Thursday before the Monday it was in. Mm. And it would be me who would be leaving one of our events at three o'clock on a Sunday morning for a 9am hand in on a Monday morning, going back, someone would have a party in my flat downstairs and I'd be upstairs, like going downstairs to have cans of Red Bull. So my master's dissertation, I'd done 4,000 of 12,000 words, 36 hours before it was due to be handed in. And I stayed up, stayed up for a day and a half, full case of Red Bull and just wrote the whole thing. And I was so wired and wrecked by the end of it that I didn't trust myself to drive to town to bind it. So I walked to town from Jesmond to get my uh, dissertation bound because I wouldn't trust myself to drive. So I trusted myself to complete a £9,000 master's dissertation I'd been working on for a year, <laughs> but didn't trust myself to drive to hand it in. I'm not sure if that's an advert for doing that or... I don't think or, so at all. It was just... It was just a, and the fact that I got through it as well, to me, my kind of synopsis of uni overall <laughs> was that it was just get it done by any means. Mm. But now looking back, I think that that should have been an identifier to me that I didn't care about the course. So I did business management and then I did international marketing. And had I have done philosophy or psychology, I would have been sufficiently stimulated by the material that I did to actually want to learn. Mm. Whereas very quickly, it was a transactional relationship between me and the university. Oh, that, that needs to get handed in. Right, I'll just bash it out. Minimum, minimum <clears throat> um, effective dose. Did you have minimum... an ongoing stress before, like, say, three months before it was in? No. Or, okay, fine. So at least you were, you didn't you weren't bearing the, the load on your head of, like, oh, that thing's in for three months' time. Like, it's always weighing on you. And so two things that came up for both of you. The thing about handing in your dissertation, like, hours before the, dis- before the deadline. Mm-hmm. My flatmate did that and ended up, because it was universal time for dissertation hand in at 12 o'clock on a certain day, all the printers and all the libraries were jamming and massive mm-hmm. backups and art of yeah. paper. And he was losing the plot. He was absolutely losing his mind. And it's, it made me think like, you've had a year to know about this. Yeah. There's nothing about that deadline that is particularly magical. Special. Yeah. You know, you could have very easily had all this stress and stuff 
in week one or week 52. But, mm. And so the Parkinson's law thing applies so much. So mm. as, a rule of, as a rule of thumb, would you say that it might be an idea for everyone to just remove two days from the deadline? At, at least. like Remove so, two or three days from the deadline. So it means I'm you're going to avoid printer problems. You're going to avoid file losses. Oh, we should do... Oh, um, yeah. <laughs> how, do you, how do you work in a manner that means that your files never get lost? So the... Mm. I mean, I've had an assignment that I've kind of really internalised that lesson I had an assignment that I had to hand in. Um, it's due for mid October. I handed it in two weeks ago. So that's so what mid mid September. So that's a month a month early because I was like, I just don't want it on my head. I don't, the, the deadline is irrelevant. Like it has to be done by that point. Okay, I'm not going to fit my life around the deadline. I'm just going to do it when I have capacity and get it done. Mm-hmm. But we seem to think that the deadline becomes like the the point of focus, and then our life has to then mold around it, which is a terrible way to work. Mm-hmm. The the Parkinson's law thing as well about doing 30 minutes a day for any degree is so valuable, but there are certain degrees that the stack of work is not possible to backload. If you're doing medicine. So so medicine is one of them. And I've I've experienced two degrees. I did maths and business, which I know is not like a hardcore degree, but the, the first term of the first year of medicine was harder than the entire four years of <laughs> um, my maths and business degree in terms of like total workload, total cognitive load, everything like that. Wow. And so the, what they say about studying medicine is like eating 10 pancakes a day. Like it's fine to eat 10 pancakes a day, but if you miss a day, you've got 20 pancakes to eat that day. And if you miss that day, then you've got 30. And it very quickly becomes a an real... insurmountable amount of pancakes. Yeah, well, you should give him out. <laughs> What's the the most amount? How big are the pancakes? Are they little buttermilk? No, no, it's like fo- just full oh, size. Shit. So you should give them to him. Yeah, just I give them to your 105 kilos. If you ever got too many pancakes, deficit, talk to me. How so, you, I'll sort you out. Okay, <laughs> so how, um, how are students going to avoid their work being lost? If it was me working in past me, mm. it would be Google Drive. Uh, but now so I I'm, just f- saved everything on my computer and it was all fine. Oh but like, man. I had three backups of <laughs> dissertation, like physical, cloud, and um, so. I, would you would you advise anyone doing a bachelor's or a, a higher to use Evernote? Yes. So how would you use it briefly? So you can use Evernote or handwritten notes. It doesn't matter. And I, and I know you probably like because I'm Mister Paperless, but. Mm. Um, Sergeant paperless. Sergeant paperless, but... Lieutenant colonel. <laughs> like, I, I'm very anti-paper, but I recognise that some people like paper and it does help you in the data to learn better. So handwriting stuff <clears throat> does improve recall. So if you can do that, fine, but you have to be systematic from the start and you can't let any single thing get away from you. So, so what's, this, what's the system? So whether you have um, separate files for separate modules that are chronologically ordered or whatever it is... But anytime you have any scrap bit of paper, any lecture slides, whatever it is, don't just think, oh, I'll print it off later or I'll sort it later. Like, put it into the filing system straight away because if if you don't, you will end up with sub-piles and it would be like a bug in a system that just compounds and compounds. So you would aim for, I'm going to guess, anyone who doesn't understand how to use Evernote, you have notebooks and then within those notebooks you have notes. So notebooks, It's like yeah. a physical filing system, but digitized. It yeah. is, yeah. And it's, it's all it's held. It's three layers. It's all held in the cloud. So it's cloud and local, which yeah. is good. It is three. So you have notebook stacks, which is like groups of notebooks. So like a box with all your files in. Yeah. The notebooks then have sub notes in, which are each one is a, a little plastic folder. And then the notes, you can search by title or you can tag. And mm-hmm. so then you can have two ways of categorizing the same thing. So you could have um, year one, module one notebook under the year one stack but also you could tag the certain notes within there as cardiology. Mm-hmm. And then anytime other things w- within the branch of cardiology come up in different So if you're terms, in third year and you need to look at something about cardiology, it'll pull up everything across yeah. all the years. So I think for me, the, the main reason that I like that, that I like the idea of using Evernote is how many times have you seen someone post? Like I see it all the time because I've got a lot of students on my Facebook. X number of thousand words through my piece of work computer crashed and didn't save mm. x y z oh. and you go i mean the, oh, yeah it's, yeah. it's, it is, it's vomit inducing <laughs> yeah. and i've never had that i don't think i ever had it happen seriously maybe like 500 words as a as a gap but the fact that i was doing it on this weird incremental discrete sections of saving of work on microsoft word feels fucking <laughs> prehistoric yeah. now like just Same. use google docs with um Google Drive is free. 
and Evernote if you upgrade for what, like five pounds a month? It's incredible. I've not seen anyone that like whenever I recommend it to them, they're like, oh my God, like how did I not know about this before? And when now, whenever, Evernote. yeah, whenever yeah. I've seen anyone sat in a lecture with a Microsoft Word document, I'm like, you're so basic. Like yeah. just oh. get Evernote out and <laughs> start, start using it now. And if this is the thing about greasing the groove, right? If you start using Evernote in your first year, then you're in the rhythm of it when it really matters, when mm. second year kicks in and third year kicks this, in. This is the thing about the 10 pancakes or the bug in the system that very, very soon it'll be a year later and you'll, have, you'll be like, oh God, I've got to collect all my notes. Yeah. And if they're just indexed, because you don't want to be spending, you've got a month to revise. You don't want to be spending half of that time just collecting your notes and trying to pull them off things and find where they are and download them from the portal. And, yeah. you know, that is... It only becomes insurmountable if you don't just manage it in a way that is like just establish a process establish a like how much work am i willing to do per day what's my minimum effective dose to keep on top of this so it doesn't become a house fire oh, that yeah. i can't get out of and do it people and do it just fitness as well yeah yeah well that's exactly the same whole other topic isn't it <laughs> so moving on a couple more tips on academic before we what i what i keep on. laughing at incidentally is just how i don't think the, the the where your advice is coming from is <laughs> such a like you've done you did a Russian memory course oh yeah I did you, a Russian Russian memorization course which was, <laughs> like, eight was, tomes or something of but it, also it was, it was a lot yeah it was for, forty two modules and it was like you you great. are running a business while doing a medical degree and managing both of them so so, so interestingly that was something where like you know when people say like you only realize how strong you you are or your your capacity when it's fully challenged and you have to yep. work to that. Yeah. And I'm realizing how much of a serial waste man I was in my first degree. Mm. The amount of time that I wasted. Yeah. Whereas now, like knowing all of the stuff that we're discussing in this podcast, if I'd went to do my first degree de- again, it would have been an absolute Just, reason. Yeah. Could have had you cock out oh, swinging so it around. I could have had a full time job, could have done whatever, and it would have been stress free. You're just such a different person. Like yeah, I, it's, lo- looking back, like I, the prospect of even being more organised just didn't interest me. It didn't even and, it, and, it and didn't even because, factor into your landscape. Yeah, right? it, it wasn't because even, you think, like, well, that, that's an overwhelming force. I don't need that sledgehammer well, approach just to just to pass my yeah, degree. And yeah. it's like, well, yeah, that's that's true. But you are absolutely capable. If you're listening to this podcast, you're smart enough and you're capable enough to put all of these systems in place from the beginning and get away with an hour of work a day or two mm. hours of work a day and smash it. This this may sound like if you're in second or third year that it's a lost cause. All that we're saying is that greasing the groove early is good, but greasing the groove and having a system at all is mm. infinitely better than having none. So if you're listening to this and you're starting third year, or maybe you've come back and decided to listen to this and it's the beginning of January or something like mm. that, like, or you're doing an MBA, whatever it is, look at the sort of system that we're talking about, which would be Evernote, get yourself a routine during the day, have a, a wake up time that you get up to most days. If you're if you're hungover, okay, do the same thing again. But have a routine for when you're hungover. Mm-hmm. Don't allow yourself to sleep in after midday if you're hungover. So you have a, a contingency plan even for a hangover. Yeah, yeah. exactly. You've Absolutely. got numbers of routines rather than one single routine. Ryan Holiday recently did a very good Evernote post about it, where he says you don't need to be militant about your routine. You just need to be militant about your routines. Mm-hmm. Uh, okay. The, so you, have, you have a finite number of of consistent situations that you that you come up against. All you need to do is when it happens once, if it's new, model it. It'll never happen again, and you're not used to it. Plans. Yeah, that's a good chart. So on that note, never under any circumstances work with people. Don't go to the library with mates and do this kind of bullshit. Yeah, those are people. Be, they spend they'd be spending sixteen hours in the library and they work at fifteen percent capacity. And you're like, well, you may as well have done one hour. They're just not so valuing their time properly. It's absolutely so it's terrible. Brian, Brian from Optimize.me does this lovely thing, which is work done equals time times intensity. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you're like, right, okay, so I can do 10 hours at 30% or I can do three hours at 100%. Mm. Which do you want to do? And the three hours at 100% are going to bury themselves in your mind more deeply as well. And you're going to have a greater sense of satisfaction at the end of the day once you've completed it. And then you can it. relax and you're not, you haven't got this constantly elevated sense of stress. Because doing 10 Low hours of work is awful. Is all, yeah. My whole first degree was that. It yeah. was sit, I did a lot more work than I needed to. And it was a lot, well, a lot more time working than I needed to, I should mm. say. So there we go. Time. Actually, on that, on that point, I think... Um, try and create your room at university, whether it's in halls or in a, a house or private residences or whatever, once you've completed it. Have your room at university with a desk and an area 
which is conducive for you to do work. Buy, spend a little bit of money, avoid a couple of nights out and spend a little bit of money on a nice seat or get your mum and dad to buy you a nice office seat. And then you're like, right, okay. I now have no excuse for not doing my work and I can do it in silence in my room or I can listen to music, but if it's music, it's my music. Yeah, and if you don't trust yourself to do that, even even if you were to say, like, I've got my desk, Wi-Fi, I'm going to unplug the router. I'm literally just going to, like... But if you can't trust yourself to do that, then only work in the library and never work. And what, work in a kiosk in a library, so oh, yeah, you're on your own and like, you zeroed in. in a, yeah, somewhere that's, like, the antisocial... We used to have a place called The Bunker, which was, like... <clears> this, no phone signal underground or something yeah, like that. It was yeah, like a, it was literally underground. Like, I think it used to, maybe used to be a bunker, and, like, hardly anyone was there... It was 24 hours a day. There were showers and it was just this wasteland of a of a computer room. Yep. And it was just dead silent. Perfect. It was lovely. And that's where you went so, all the time. Yeah. That's where I lived. Because just, just, also, if you go somewhere that is really unpleasant to be, then you're like, right, I've got this set of tasks to do. I'm going to go to that place. And because it's unpleasant, I'm going to have an in- inherent incentive to spend the minimum time there. Mm. So I'm just going to spend... That's why I like the idea of having... Even now, like I've only recently given us, I got back to having a home office in my room and I love it. Mm. Like it's just somewhere else where I can do work and it's not, it's just a nice, it's a change of scenery. It's silent. That's because now you're self-motivated to do, I suppose you said the error you made was you were doing a degree that didn't feel aligned with Mm -hmm. what you were. So I guess motivating yourself to do it at home, you'd be like, oh man, this is a... So moving on, uh, relationships, I think would be quite a good one. I just have one more, just final thought. Yep. Just be, I'm just imagining what 18 year old me would think yep. if I was listening to this. Would you think, you shut what, the fuck up? Well, exactly, <laughs> because you want to have a good time. But I think trying to look at it as you're buying a very expensive, either if it's vocational qualification that requires you to go and be a doctor or architect or whatever, or a very expensive signal to employers, which is like, I'm semi organized. Mm-hmm. It's extremely expensive. So you need to get that outcome. So how do you have the best time while creating that outcome? And having that discipline actually creates the best experience yeah so it's the discipline equals freedom idea that without when people think oh i'll just i'll loll around like do what i did basically i'll loll around and then create these stressful chunks of my uni life Mm. actually just chip away at it you'll have the best time overall and get a good degree a really good point that the fact that doing a little bit of work and consistently will allow you to have more spare time conversely it sounds like oh well you're asking me to be constantly working no i'm not Mm. i'm asking you to split your work up into manageable you have to do chunks. the work anyway. And if you're not going to do the work, then you need to leave university. <laughs> so like, you're going to do that volume of work. So just do it in a manageable way. And then you'll be that guy there who's like, how's he getting, well, like Yusuf, how's he getting those results <laughs> while you know, he's doing doing all these other things and he's still getting these results? It's because of the process in the system. Cool. So relationships, Johnny, you said that you had some comments <laughs> on relationships at university. So I, um, <laughs> I broke up with my girlfriend just before I went to university. Okay. Um, because you were going to university. Yeah. Because I had, <laughs> I, remember, <Same. laughs> I remember thinking like, I can't possibly go to university with a girlfriend, <laughs> which is uh, why I don't know. But so when I got to uni, like a few people I, that I was living with had a relationship mm. that they were still in. I remember thinking like, what are you doing? It's like someone arrives, like having not enrolled on their course. Like, what the fuck are you doing? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, but best decision I ever made, I think. How long did the relationships of the people who you lived with last for? Not long at all. It was like the Battle of the Somme, honestly. It was just, I remember just... People getting shot down left, right and centre. It was just like things like, you just watch people cheat on each other and it was just... Oh yeah, there was a lot, and especially the people who were in the long distance relationships that were like, no, no, we're really, we're really for the long term, man, like... Yeah. And a week later you see them just in an orgy with... I think... Did you? Did you see Everyone's got a dick in their mouth. It's terrible. So it's, it's what you were saying, Chris, about like, you go to uni thinking, I'm 18, man, like, I know what's going on. I know what I want. I know what my values are. You haven't got a clue. So like, hampering that first year of your life at university when you're going to meet probably the most concentration of new people and have all these like, weird, intense experiences with people, even like, mate, that's my pan. 
<laughs> like what yeah. you do in the bike yeah. park, like yeah. Yeah. you know, like weird, weird experiences like that. <laughs> I, know, I know exactly. That what was like, such a common experience. Yeah. But it, exactly, <laughs> like what, like who's eating my bacon? Yeah. What well, sort mm-hmm. of stuff? Like you just need time to figure it out, and you don't need to have it's crippling, isn't it? Something else to manage at the same I th- time. I think that that's a really nice way to come at it because it can quite easily lead to us sounding like we're saying you should just spray it around as much as possible during your time at university, which isn't necessarily right. I think what we're saying is that you should expose yourself to as many learning experiences yeah. as you can, mm-hmm. and. L- a relationship is nothing short of a mitigating factor in that. Now, a lot of short relationships at university, I actually think is quite good to good learning experience. But if you're going to look at anything, you would take some statistics and you would then model what you're going to do off the back <laughs> of the statistics. I would love there to be a representative sample of how many people arrive at university with their girlfriend or boyfriend that they had in college and what the drop-off rate is. Mm. Because mine lasted oh. until... So did you arrive at uni with a girlfriend? With a girlfriend, and I'd, that was like my first main girlfriend as well. Right. So I was like, oh, God, like, a, you know, you've got this sense of belonging. You've got this kind of, I've never had a girlfriend before. I don't really know how to do it. And uh, like, I'm naturally oddly sentimental in any case. So that kind of all was a perfect storm of me just not letting go. Mm. And it was just, I ended up sacrificing so many experiences at uni. And that's not turning down girls to sleep with, although obviously that was part of it. It was just stuff like, that that person is at a different stage of their life than you are. Even if they're at a different university, it's a different stage of their life because it's a different place. And exactly. you end up, am I going to go to this cricket social? No, I'm not. My girlfriend's up. Mm-hmm. It's my, it's like, so my 21st birthday, for instance, was another girlfriend was spent with my then girlfriend crying to me on the phone because I decided to go out with my mates instead of go and see her on my 21st birthday. So I didn't have a good 21st birthday at all, mm. regardless of whether I was with her or still at university. Mm. And I'm just... She like, managed to remotely mess it up. Just yeah, a really long Yeah, a really long grenade. <laughs> yeah. And um, I think, yeah, like just... <laughs> I think you need to be, and this, this shouldn't be, this shouldn't class as like, if you are in a relationship, you should get rid of it. I think the, the best model for this is if you're in a relationship, when you go to university and you're confident that you want to stay in it, then do so. But the second that you think that it, that you are unhappy in the relationship, then call it quits there and then, because not only are you wasting your own life, but you're wasting the other person's life Mm. because they can be happy with someone else as opposed to being happy with someone who's unhappy with them. Even just the the headspace that... So I, I remember, like, you go to sort of a, a, a... There's loads of stuff that goes on in Freshers' Week parties and meeting new people and all sort of stuff. People with boyfriends and girlfriends were definitely in, a, like, a less open frame of mind mm-hmm. going to those things. That's for new experiences. Because yeah. you're like, oh, like, what if someone makes a move, like, I can't do anything, I'm going to have to have that awkward conversation. I'm going to have to say, oh, where were you last night? Oh, I went to this after party. Exactly. Like, well, no, you should go mm. to the after party because you've never been to one before. Exactly, mm. yeah. So, yeah, the, the predominant theme I saw with those with people who are in a relationship was fear, anxiety, mm-hmm. trepidation, just, like, they're just desperately hanging on to what they know is and safe now, from like, their home relationship. Yeah. And so they're just, like, they're just not, they're just, yeah, it's dipping your toe into the whole experience and being like, oh, it's okay because I've... I've got a girlfriend. It was almost like a, a, a excuse or a shield that was being used. Very much to- so. I think people use, to a degree, I've seen some people use sports as that as well, so that they'll choose to not do something social that takes them out of their comfort zone. Oh, mate, no, I've got rugby, sorry. Yeah, because I've got this, and it's like, well, no, hang on, you can um, do I'm, both. Mate, I'm on the C team. Like- yeah, 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 exactly. Mate, no one even knows your name. Like, it's fine. Um, I think as well falling into a relationship during Freshers' Week or the first few weeks of the year, like... Also a mistake. It's the it's, same same as, like, the, you know, the first people you meet, you just... Latch on to. Yeah, yeah exactly. Like, I th- there is going to be no time in your life that you're going to meet such a wide range of people. Like, just accept the, the sheer odds that are in front of you, that the likelihood of you meeting the person you should be in a relationship with being within the first couple of days and also living on your floor in your halls. It's infinitesimal, isn't it? It's probably yeah. pretty low. Yeah. Mm. Or like, you're extremely fortunate. Yeah. Yeah. But, well, yeah. I mean, but that's what, that's in the back of everyone's minds, right? It's like, what it's, if? Oh, oh, no, no, this is, this yeah. is why it's right. It's right because we're so close. Mm. And you're like, no, it's not. It's a fucking nightmare because you're so close. I see it all the time, right? Like these guys and girls come to university and they just tumble straight into a relationship because it gives them a sense of comfort. It gives them this sense of belonging. Someone's got their back. And it just turns toxic so very, very fast. 
again, what I want to try and get across is getting into relationships at university isn't necessarily a bad thing. The problem is clinging on to them once they're already gone. Like, you know, you know that it's gone and treat it. If it was easy come, treat it as easy go. Mm. And that's one of my primary problems at uni was letting go of things like that. Like that, it was very, very difficult mm. for me. Mm. So I didn't want to. It's and a sort of grabby fear to just like quickly just pin something down. Because it's like, like it's familiar, isn't it? It's yeah. you're searching for familiarity in a, in a part, time of your life where everything's new and nothing stays the same. It's a lovely way to put it. I think as well, another, another thing is that your sample size. So at 18 years old, your sample size of life experience is so low. Like you've really at 18 only been close to the person that you are right now for probably about two years. Because two yeah. years ago, you were a completely different person. Well, you were doing your GCSEs. And yeah. Like, Do you know what I mean? Yeah, so if you, if you've been with, like that, that's mental, isn't fucking it? crazy. <laughs> so think about the fact that if you're in a relationship for six months at the age of 18, so that large fraction of your life. It's a but. very, it's a significant proportion of the time you've been alive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And you go, right, okay, mm-hmm. so I, I need to try and look upon this. And that's the problem with this perspective. I think a lot of what we're trying to get across here is the fact that you need perspective. It's horrible because I had such a, had a lack of self-awareness combined with a lack of experience and um, this sort of, I, I mean, I'm so, I'm so lucky that, um, my girlfriend broke up with me before I went to uni because I and I was upset at the time. Forgot about it within a week because of <laughs> starting the you know uni, and then I was like, actually, that unconsciously poorly articulated feeling of what you've described, both of you, of like the seeing people in a relationship and just seeing something a bit um, mm. held back about them and a, and a bit like unwilling to to dive in, and the people who were in a relationship, yeah, they fallen at the first hurdle. Because they're they've like they're in cling mode already, but then the people that fall at the second hurdle are the ones that then jump into a relationship with the first person that they mm. that they sleep with or they meet. And you've had the worst of of all scenarios because you've had you've missed out on months of experience. You've had to navigate a failed relationship remotely while at uni. Potentially some really traumatic, man. Awful conversations. Ruined your twenty first birthday. Ruined, yeah, yeah like, ruined my twenty first birthday. I remember getting into another argument. I was in another argument as I was trying to write like the first set of exam, the first set of assignments for my master's. <clears throat> and I'm just that looking at master's. Mm. Should I say master's? I, I don't know. Say it, whatever it, you want, Chris. <laughs> it, it sounds off compared to the rest of your accent, but I don't know what I say. It's always, it's one of those bath, words. It's like, bath. it's like plaster or plaster. You know, I like say, plaster, uh, you're right. I say plaster ad for everything else, but masters, I always, I don't know why. So you, like, you, what's the name of this app? Without thinking about it. Garage band. Oh, okay. Not garage band. Garage band. We've never that that, that's American. Yeah. Abdomen. <laughs> Abdomen. What Abdomen. would you say? Would you say masters? I bet you would. Masters. Yeah, you would. I'm hybrid, I think. Oh, God. Anyway. <laughs> what about so, plasterboard? Plasterboard. Plasterboard. Not, plasterboard. Not, bath. Plasterboard. I, uh, plasters. Masters. So I would say a plaster. Plaster. But plaster. Plasterboard. Yeah, yeah. I'd say that as well. I think Verb it's and <laughs> I'm just going to go plaster the wall. Oh, would you like it? Pl- would you like a plaster? Do you like a plaster? Do you plaster your finger? <laughs> well, do you? I don't know. Are you, I mean, you can do if you just like. Uh, no, gen- no, but gentlemen, anyway. we've, gone, we've gone off topic again. <laughs> um, so, on the topic of on the topic of being single at university, university, wear a condom for heaven's sake. <laughs> that's, I mean, that's that's my point. Oh, okay. My point is, yeah. f- for the love of God, wear a prophylactic we- because <laughs> for a prophylactic. the easiest way to do it is buy them at the start of the year. Buy a big box, like a 30 box of Durex. Yeah, stick with the brands. Keep one in your wallet Don't at all. In, keep, so yeah. have a buffer level of them and keep one in your wallet at all times. Get them for free. From so the I've heard keeping it in your wallet can cause... Abrasion. Yeah. Uh, if you sit on your wallet, because I put my wallet in my back pocket. Right, okay. But just I, would rather have just an, I would rather have an abrased condom than no condom at I mean, all. There's an argument to say birth rates are dropping in the UK. Uh. Like we should be giving the... <laughs> Pick, put a tiny little pin prick in the edge. <laughs> Staples it's to your notes. Property prices. And then, yeah. Um, yeah. The other Staples way. <laughs> to your notes. <laughs> the receipt. Okay. Receipt, receipt, receipt. Oh, condom. Well, that um, fake girl in the math class that you can just be like, oh, I'm just going to oh, pull that off. Put that off. <laughs> um, so put them in the bedside table next to your bed because yeah. it's, the same, it's the same as defrosting the chicken the night before. If you mm. don't defrost the chicken the night before, you can't food prep in the morning. 
If the condom isn't near the bed, it's an erection killer. Isn't the it? likelihood it is a, it is an erection Silent killer. killer. Do you That's know what it is? I'm going to touch. I'm going to touch on something that I've wanted to talk about for ages, and I'm going to probably going to bring it up on another one. You talk about erectile dysfunction. Yeah. Wow. So, guys at university, it is normal. It is absolutely normal for you to not be able to get it up when you're pissed. It's absolutely normal for you to not be able to get it up when it's in your head that you can't get it up as well. Yeah. But for me at uni, I think it was maybe my third year. And I was absolutely blind drunk, out of my mind drunk. Couldn't get it up when I went back with the girl. And then that started to become a self-referential echo chamber that was like, okay, now I've only had a couple of drinks. Oh, God, that problem might happen again. Then it does. And then it gets to the stage where you're like, oh, shit, maybe this is going to start happening when I'm sober. And sure enough, it actually does. Wow. And you're like, right, okay, I need to break the spell of this somehow. And it's really, really difficult. And I've got, I've got a number of friends who have, this has been a cascade into a really, really horrible situation. And all that it needed was someone to say this, which mm. is, it is perfectly normal mm-hmm. to not be able to get it up when you're pissed. And if you laugh it off, she'll laugh it off as well. Mm. And if you're a girl, it doesn't matter if it's never happened to you before. It's not about you. It's about the amount of alcohol that he's had to drink. And if it happens, be gracious about it and just say, don't worry, you're not the first. Like, because that mm. is just going to make him go, oh, thank God for that. Yeah. That makes me feel so much better. Because at 19, 20 years old, thinking I've got erectile dysfunction oh, crushing. is fucking terrifying. Yeah. Did it happen to you? It's, ha- it's happened to me a couple of times, yeah. And you it's go through the, a little cycle. It's, of- the, it's the thought. It's the split second of, God, imagine what would... Oh, no. Oh, oh it's happened. <laughs> well, that's a good tip then, because you've given people the safety catch to... Um, to to stop the safety valve to yeah. stop that happening, and if it happens in the moment, you've given both men and women a way to. There you go. Just laugh it off. The only happening. reason that it happens is it's the it's the antagonistic reaction to being relaxed. So like you, it requires relaxation. You are creating anxiety and stress. So yeah. interesting mnemonic we use for that is um, point and shoot. <laughs> so uh, parasympathetic nervous system regulates erection, and sympathetic nervous system, which is the fight flight, regulates ejaculation. And so P point S shoot. No, nice. yeah. but yeah, I think, you know, so deep, deep breaths, relax. deep breaths. Yeah. And just concede the fact that like, if you've, if you've put 10 pints and a bunch of shots into yourself and you've been day drinking on a bank holiday Sunday or something, mm. like there are men across the world that this happens to. Yeah. And the problem that you have is that you don't know that it's that common. Yeah. Especially when you're that age, I think. And you're terrified of saying it, it. So my, my experience happened a few times at uni and I remember thinking like, wow, like I really hope that never happens again. But it just takes a few conversations with people as you get into your 20s and everyone's like, and you're like oh, actually, of course it's yeah. this is really common. Yeah. But you, no one, when you're 18, 19. No one wants to be the first person exa- to, to raise it. Yeah. Uh, guys, is anyone else um, strong oh, to no. get erection? Uh, yeah. j- just me then. <laughs> Does anyone remain flaccid when they're inside of a woman? I'm struggling to maintain my turgidity <laughs> and during so, coitus. So the good tip on the condoms. So I, I, I saw a patient who... The staple. The, not the state. Don't don't <laughs> staple. That was a joke. Do not staple your condoms. Um, saw a patient who fresh as week was a virgin. Had sex with one woman. Didn't use a condom. Got HIV. Oh so my god! It's so fucking hell. Yeah. So like that's oh extremely unlucky. But, but like, uh, yeah. The the chances of it. It is brutal, oh isn't it? Oh my god! <laughs> so you just you don't know who. You was it a guy? Putting, it was a man, yeah. He had sex with a woman. So it was like a, and the thing is, as yeah, well, the transmission so, rates female to male are lower than male to female. This is something else, yeah, girls. So it's like just ultimate unlucky. Wasn't yeah, it? Like, girls, if you are if you are listening, your chance of call the snitch, didn't he? Call the girl the snitch. Your your chance of catching a HIV, uh, catch, catching a HIV, catching an STI as a girl because of the shape of your sexual organs. Well, just think what happens. Like you, you have a receptacle in your pelvis, where and people are shooting things into it, like. Possibly infected things. <laughs> you're gonna, <laughs> like you're going to. That's, that's how losing erection. Just play that. Back. <laughs> play that small segment back to this yourself. This is where it's going to be the, the. That's going to be the preview. <laughs> yeah, it is. Oh. You have a you have a receptacle. Isn't it? <laughs> Fucking hell. So yeah, I think as much. Con- and then once you're in a relationship with someone, easiest way to do it. If you want to be hyper hyper safe. Both go and get checked because both of you should do it in any case. Get the and text. then once you are, go to fucking town. Yeah. Like, mm. 
make sure that she's on whatever form of uh, birth control that is yeah, appropriate right for her. Person. I'm glad um, you said that. <laughs> what, as opposed to just, like, it, it, start it, it, making uni oh, babies? You're STI free. Just go to town. Like, oh. uh, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Can't get pregnant in the ear. Oh, yeah. Um, so, Hopefully. relationships relationships on that one there. What about um, what about making friends and stuff like that? So, I've suggested my, my main one is join an events company. If you're, if you like to go out and you like to party and stuff like that, I think it's a fantastic way. Sports teams, I've societies. I've no tips on this. I haven't got any friends, so I don't. I'm, You've got us too. Want to. But we, yeah, we, I'm your friend. But I pay you to. to yeah, you know, it know, was a donation. You don't have to mention that. Uh, you don't have to uh, say uh, that. We'll cut that out. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Johnny, you did like rowing and stuff, right? I did. Interestingly, so the, there were two types of people that I encountered at uni. People who were obsessed about being on like the rugby or the rowing socials and, and all that sort of stuff. And people who very much just kind of like kept themselves themselves. I was really good friends with some of the people, funnily enough, in my flat where I was like in, where I was a fresher. And they were the people who I ended up being really friend, really friendly with. And I'm still in touch with all of them now, 10 years later. Mm. Um, one of them has just, another wedding, just got engaged. <laughs> Asked me to be his best man. Really? Oh. Yeah. So that's crazy. So, so, so the, the point with that is again, like as I just view everything in my life, like what, what are we trying to get out of this? Like, what's the, what's the goal here? Like be the best man. Do you want, well, yeah, I mean, bingo, done it, completed it. Do you want to leave uni with loads of like low level acquaintances that you never speak to after graduation? Or would it be nice to have like a couple of friends that you, that you speak to for the rest of your life? And so I think there were a lot of people who paid a lot of very diffuse attention to a large group of people because they felt like that gave them popularity and, and uh, status. Okay. Yeah. That's, that's but, a good point. So I guess it depends on the timeline as well. Like mm. you, it's like if you see your university degree three years as a funnel, you don't have to um, narrow down in year one. You can spread your net wide, feel out loads of different types of people, mm-hmm. not literally, yeah, but don't touch them. Um, yeah, do not touch them, but just f- f- feel them all out and then be like, actually, this group who I thought I was mates with was just because of the primacy effect. Yeah. And then... You want to split test, don't you? Split, yeah. And, you know, there's no problem with split testing your social life because ultimately it's it's a reciprocal relationship. As long as you understand that it won't be a true split test. Yeah. But like, people people are so <laughs> tribal, man. Like they, well, the fear I had was that because of that, because people are so tribal, I thought like, oh, if I... Um, if I don't like knuckle down now with that group, then I'm going to lose them or somehow. Mm. But actually... Well, I remember like, being I remember being at uni and some of my friends... Um, being like, also oh, like, who are you going out with tonight? And they take a the piss. Oh, you're going out with like the promo lads, are you? Ugh. And it's like, okay, there we go. That's like, mm. the, that's the tribal nature. And the problem is, if you are, if you are in a group of people who don't have a sufficiently high level of emotional intelligence to understand that this is a good idea and that they should be doing it too, <laughs> you become it's their fear talking. There, you, you become a, a, a victim of their own insecurities. Yeah, mm. which is really fucking dangerous mm. because if you sequester to what they think you should do you, you, it's a very very fucking slippery slope it, it is projection isn't it they project like this is what I think I should be doing I think you should be doing the same thing yeah. if you're not I'm going to criticise and try you're, and you're going out spot. with a different group of people they yeah. see you as I wish I should I wish I was able to go out with a different group of people yeah. you're not going out with us therefore you're out of our little social yeah. circles yeah. if that's the case then screw them well just use it as a you can use it as a big fucking red flag about like this person yeah, yeah. and, and the true. position stop yeah. loss yeah. stop loss yeah, <laughs> exactly. move, the, move the that into another, another portfolio um, I think another good point is do not choose the flatmates you're going to live with in second year or third year in October oh, and oh. I see this happen all the time <laughs> like the number of people and this the is the second a, year flat is always the rockiest isn't it yeah because, it's yeah, yeah you've just made the dis- a rash decision early on. And one of the problems is that because good student accommodation, good private student accommodation is becoming more and more uh, competitive now, that it's common for a lot of the good flats, well-priced flats, to go by November, December time. And you're like, okay, like there definitely is a spectrum between wanting to go early enough to still have a good choice of all <clears throat> houses but late enough to be able to make a good choice of flatmates. Mm. But I can tell you a fine fact. You would much sooner live in a shit house with good housemates than a good house with assholes. Yeah. So I would tend matter. towards the latter. Mm-hmm. Like 
you don't need to make the decision before Christmas. Like if you have, unless you're absolutely certain and you get on like a house on fire with these people and you know all of them. Another one as well. There's very few towns that finding a flat is so competitive that you have to do it before. <laughs> well, you'd be December surprised, man. Well. Newcastle, Newcastle is. Newcastle really? is one of those, but for the really nice ones. For, and then you're talking centre, value yeah. as well. Right. But I'd imagine like you're not, you're not totally like you will find somewhere to live that is acceptable if you yeah. start searching in March or whatever, you know, it's not like you. Another thing to consider I would refrain from living in a house with any more than max five people, mm. ideally four. Yeah, I agree. Because I was in a seven in my second year and, right. it, and we chose it early on and it, it, it worked out just about okay, but I could, I could see it having gone very bad quite easily. Did you split in third year into two houses? Yeah. Yeah. There was also a guy who we knew who they did a similar thing. This group of people, like one of the guys on their corridor, they want to, they like, didn't want to leave him out so they went they lived with him and he ended up um, being a sex offender he ended up putting one of these like fake usb sticks in the bathroom and filming the girls showering and um like was saving the videos on his computer police raided the house he threw his laptop in like a bin on the street um and ended up as like so so basically jesus fucking yeah (laughs) that is a hot hot story right there (laughs) Um, I think as well, another another good point to remember when you get into your second and third year house is I would genuinely, genuinely advise at the halfway point and then at the end point, just pay for a professional clean. <laughs> like I didn't get... So you're those, a five, be- five person house, it's like three quid each or something, isn't it? So, so just do a, do a halfway point. So do it just after Christmas before you come back to uni, pay for a professional clean. On a five bed house, it'll be maybe... 300 400 quid at absolute tops and that's if you've essentially like infested the place mm. um and then do another one at the end because it is not worth your time you do not have the expertise the inclination the time or the um tools to be able to clean your second year house to the standard that it was when you moved so you lose it your is, deposit anyway yeah so you may as well there was a five five of us in a, a house in jesmond 500 pounds each in the DPS and we didn't get a single penny of really? it back. Hmm. Two and a half grand it cost to get our house back to working order. There was... Well, according to the agent, whereas you guys... I, it was, I honestly think we got a deal. Quid. I genuinely think we got a deal. Wow. Like, okay. there was... You got two and a half grand of damage and you think it was... More they had to refloor the entire kitchen because there were these maggots that were powered by protein powder because oh. all of us a mixture of protein powder and creatine so they're all grown to humongous <laughs> sizes yeah exactly they were all in there benching pizza crusts oh, and um, th- we had 210 bottles of uh, Tesco value vodka that were just like strewn around we'd spelled out do you remember when nuts was a big, was How, a yeah, yeah. big thing nuts so we, had, we spelled nuts out with the bottles on a street was this over one year one year and how many people in the flat five so 210 <laughs> divided by 5, 42. So that's one per week per person. Yeah. That's, that's a very like consistent rate of throughout <laughs> yeah. the uh, Well, they did the, took the advice that we gave of establish a routine. True. 10 pancakes a day. Yeah. Just yeah. <laughs> bottle of vodka a week. Well, I mean, there was, there was once... <laughs> Don't miss a week. There was once upon a time <laughs> when Morrison's were doing three litres of Morinov vodka for 12 pounds. This is before minimum unit pricing came in. And I imagine you would have drunk other things. You wouldn't have just lived on vodka. So it that... was majoritively vodka. <laughs> it was mostly vodka. Calories, isn't it? There was, a time, yeah, it was, calories. There was a time where we were so poor that all of us were drinking water, dilute juice, like dilute orange and vodka. Oh my God. Together. Well, that's, that's a cocktail because that's three well, ingredients, isn't it? So... <laughs> That's my idea of a cocktail. I really what have we, like diluted juice. Diluted juice. What have we missed off your list? So, um... I have a cleaning story. Oh, okay. So I, I tried to clean my flat myself with my... On your own? No, no. So, like, we looked at the price of a cleaner, like... That, Two hundred, three hundred quid or something. Went to... We're like, it's all right, we'll hire... Like, we'll just hire the stuff we need. And I can... I just really clearly remember the way this woman said this. So went into B&Q, went up to the lady in B&Q... Very little, very aggressive Scottish lady <laughs> looked to you. So if there's a group of people, whoever she was speaking to, she like looked straight in the eye like that. And we went, do you have any cleaning equipment? She was like, no, <laughs> you don't have any cleaning equipment. She's like, well, we've got the rug doctor. Uh, <laughs> the rug doctor. Like, Aye, the rug doctor. <laughs> we'll take the rug doctor. 
which I'm is so this, happy like, to hear where this has come from. <laughs> me too. Story. Yeah. But this is, it's a tower with, that basically shoots out water out the front of it, runs some brushes over it, and then that's like a dry brush at the back. It's shite, basically. Uh, we've got the doctor. The doctor. <laughs> The doctor will sort you out. <laughs> the doctor's here to see you. It's three so different pastologies like, of the elbow. Pour this, <laughs> poured this like purple stuff into this thing, pushed it over the carpet, did one row, and we're like, right, <laughs> that's jammed. That's like, dyed the carpet a different colour <laughs> in one specific street. Ow. Just, I don't know why. It so must have just somehow. something to do with the carpet. Oh. So then I had to do the whole house in, in this colour, in this new thing. And then they try to take the deposit office because somebody left a closed condom wrapper under the bed. We had uh, used condoms under our bed when I moved in. Didn't care. The, oh, really? Yeah, the agent oh. were just like, wow. oh, sorry, mate. And the used condoms and uh, loads of Maltesers just on the floor. Well, as a, Someone had a good time, didn't they? Yeah. So here's the way. Here's a little hack for you. The way that um, as I'm slowly moving into landlord life, I'm beginning to understand this. The way that the DPS, the Deposit Protection Scheme, works is to do with the tenants returning the property in the condition that it was moved into it. So what you actually really want is for the condition of the property that you move into to be as dirty as is possible whilst still acceptable. Mm. Then complain to the landlord or the letting agent. They'll come round, they'll clean it, but your inventory will be done at the mm. uh, condition that it was when you moved in. So if you do move in, take photos, have a little bit of a look. If there's any marks, stuff like that, just grab a couple of snaps, Evernote them. <laughs> nice. And then, Scannable. and then in, uh, and you can set a date on the Evernote to remind you. For, yeah, here it is. Very nice. And then, uh, yeah, there you go. You, basically you want it to be as low as possible mm. so that when you end up moving out, you're like, well, no. that's cool. No, so no rug doctor. Only other thing on my social list was Leg just doctor. visit your family occasionally like don't just completely sack them off but also i mean it's, it's difficult giving advice like this because some people are proper homebodies and they'll they'll go home every week mm. and have their mum come and do their laundry like which i've i've seen so but as in like to come up to like across the country to come and do their laundry and then so that's it's difficult but basically see see your family at a cadence of once a month probably the safe mm. So I, think yeah, another, I think another thing to consider as well, which I never ever did at uni, was that you've left your mum and dad and uh, and family back home and the dogs and stuff like that. And although you're having this fantastic time, your parents probably miss you. Life just went on for them as normal. So they're they're now in the house and there's no more no more use of mess anymore. <laughs> there's no more like him coming in from college and talking to you about how his day's been. Like, think about if you were them. Like, if you were a parent, you'd want to feel like you were a part of your child's life as they've moved away to uni. So invite them up. Let Show them your university room. Like, if you've got a sports game that you're playing at or if you're doing a play or if you've got a presentation for uni or if you've got whatever, like, invite them up to it because... That's that, a very good point, actually. That'd be a very meaningful experience for your parents. Like, th- there's so many um, relationships, mature relationships that go to seed and... Uh, people's parents split up during the first couple of years of university because the final thing which bonded these two adults together was the rearing of this child. And I'm not saying that you inviting your parents up once every six weeks is going to save their marriage, but it's definitely at least going to make them feel a little bit better. Mm. I, I saw that happen. I saw someone witness the breakup of their parents in like the first oh, month of uni. Grim. Mm. It's mad, man. Like, yeah. It's like tech, text them as well. Yeah, exactly. Like, just, just like, yeah. just keep, keep. keep you're spending, you're spending eight hours a day on your phone. Like, mm. you can, you can afford to. And text. like, they have played a massive part in getting you to that point. Exactly. Just because you're nailing it's... birds with condoms um, and like doing all the fun stuff, like it still doesn't mean you can mm. Mm. make text time you. to text Bloody your parents. Just not while you're nailing a bird with a condom. Mm. I or, just, I can't imagine. Sorry. Or man. Or man. You can or nail man. or two man. men or, or man, man or woman. Yeah. Whatever just don't want. use other people's olive oil as lube when you're having an orgy, especially when they've just bought it for £3.75. <laughs> can you tell? A bit, a bit of I can though. tell I, that you weren't I, the person in the orgy. No, but it was your olive oil. I was, I was the owner of the olive oil. I woke up the next day, where's all my olive oil going? Oh, sorry, mate, we had an orgy last night. Oh, like, what, with, with olive oil? Yeah. What, what, I mean, why are you that? They showed me photos as well. I was like, guys, like... 
I mean, just bought that. It wasn't even open. They like clicked it open. But I mean, I'd be sad about the use of the olive oil, but I wouldn't feel disgusted because it would be almost impossible to put it back in. That's true. Yeah. It was one of the like dispenser bottles as well. So uh, yeah. yeah. But even then, what are they going to do? Is scrape it up and down their skin. And, you, you know, know what you should do to protect it. yourself from that? One of those like one cal sprays. Yeah. Not no, going back in no there. No one's going to be using that. Probably still have an orgy with it. If you put it your mind to sl- it. It would slow things down, but yeah. Yeah, yeah true. significantly. Yeah. So, so, this is only one calorie. Yeah. It's like a one yeah. stroke spray, isn't it? It would be like a pull out and a squirt. You just have to keep and then a pull out they, and a. They'd be using. Keep, keep reapplying. Yeah, they'd be using Gary's butter instead. So, <laughs> um, so the other categories I've got. So we've been through academic, we've been through social and relationships. Mm-hmm. Um, we haven't done fatness. Fatness. Fitness. Yeah, Fitness so, so I've got fatness. physical and financial left. Let's go financial. At Dean. Okay, so the, the point that Johnny made earlier, which is very, very well put, of. A degree is an investment. And so when people be like, when people are like, when people be like, um, <laughs> <laughs> setting up a business okay. is okay. a business, a business. <laughs> is uh, too risky. It's like you're putting yourself in 60 grand of debt <clears throat> um, to go and do something that is. Is that how much university is now? Well, for nine, for me, nine grand a year times Fuck. six years plus living costs. So yeah, pretty but um, remembering that our first our, the tuition fees for all of our first degrees at nine percent as well nine point one percent is the new so it's, it's six point one up until twenty four thousand but then anything above that is it's nine point one like mortgage levels of debt isn't it yeah I think just sack off your student debt just pay minimum or, or go to go to Paraguay or Cayman Islands and just anyway um, so yeah the, it was somewhat it was Nate Schmidt that said you are taking on like a huge amount of debt to go and work a job that guarantees like 30 grand a year for life, maybe with a slight incremental growth. That's much more risky than starting a business, for example. Mm. So do start a business, do like, you know, it doesn't mean it's not mutually exclusive. You can do finances outside, outside of uni or while well, you're at uni. Both. So, so remember that like uni itself is a, is an investment. And so make sure you pass it because Otherwise, you've got the worst of both worlds. You're just committed to the debt plus the... Yeah. Uh, yeah. So the debt doesn't go away just because you failed. Oh, God. Yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> it's just tinged well, with regret. If you never earn above, like, what is it, 15K, like, just cruise below the radar. Well, yeah. No so you, you, you cruise below the radar. But the, the point is, you are there to maximise your return on that investment. Yeah. So mm. you've already committed to the debt, even if you don't feel the, the cost of that because of student loans until mm-hmm. later... So make the most of the opportunities. Like you are there in an academic hub where there are people around you that are complete sources of knowledge, like your professors, the people around you, the libraries, other people, the course. So just soak it up. Hammer the student discounts as well and just um, take as much as you as much as you can that's designed to feed you during that time. I would be interested to hear your thoughts on whether or not you would advise people to take a year in industry. Oh, I think Johnny probably has more Ooh, thoughts when, on that. Like, Between second and third year? No. Why? If you get paid, then fine. Well, yeah, no, you'd take it as a, as a <coughs> so, proper well, in industry. Mm. I mean, I, I didn't do Just it. pop that over there because it sometimes buzzes the mic. Okay. Um, is that okay? Um, I think the year in industry, what you're trying to get out of that is, do I want to go into that line of work? Mm. And I think you can do that in a lot less time than a year. Like obviously, yes, if you get like a salary or pro rate salary. Grade. I would I would only be talking about if you got a, a like a I think a typical like internship's maybe like eighteen grand for the year right. or something because like that. Because the, the two benefits are it potentially gets you a job mm. following, assuming mm-hmm. you like it, I suppose, but it gives you the information that you mm. um that you like it or don't and it pays you. But it delays you as well. So the, so I did two internships over summer that were of that format, just shorter. Mm-hmm. Like, one was five weeks. One was first time I met you, actually. Yes. It was during one of them. Yeah. And the other one was eight weeks long. Um, and got offered a job at the end of one of them. And oh, it was, so it's still so paid. So you it's can like, still get the job offer. With yeah. Shorter it's like a summer so. holiday, basically. And you get a flavour of... Um, and I remember thinking, I don't want to do either of these things. <laughs> but... But I think it's, it's a job offer in the bag. So yeah. I think well, that's yeah. definitely... so my approach to how I would plan my university years now, if it was me, is I would do university year study. Then I would do a summer abroad okay, as probably a party rep or something similar. Yeah. yeah. 
um, because the intensity of experience that you're going, that you end up having. Like I did in between, this was a terrible idea in between my bachelor's and my master's. I did a, you've laughed at master's again. <laughs> uh, I did a year in Ibiza. Now, one of the problems of doing a year in Ibiza was I came back and my mind was about 75% of the speed before I'd gone out there. <laughs> um, so it took a little bit of time for me to get back up to operate. Did you, level. That, that's not a year in industry now. I suppose no, for you, so technically my point, it is. My point, my point is that you get a, um, you get to experience a lot of partying over the summer. Mm. I would also advise a year in industry. And my reason for that is that by the time that you're 21, and you finished, if you've never spent any consistent time working, now the internship, uh, summer internship kind of gets around this, mm -hmm. but with my model of going away and working abroad in Magaluf or Marbella mm -hmm. or whatever, you can't do that. Yep. If you've never been in a nine to five and felt what it feels like to sit in an office all the time, you are going to tumble out. So one of my flatmates, JT, he'll be listening. He went, did three years at uni. This is before placement years were really a thing. Years in industry were really a thing. And he tumbled straight out of uni, 21 years old, into the Aldi graduate scheme. Oh, it's intense. 60 plus hours a week. Yeah. Working in Middlesbrough, mm -hmm. living with us. And he'd done his six weeks of being a checkout person. And he was on 40 grand. You're like, you're 20 years old on 40 grand a year. Audi A4 outside, like full th And it sounds fantastic, but he never wanted to work in retail. He didn't want to do... 60 hours a week of work and this guy's now just left a job at Bloomberg to go work at BlackRock right and you're like okay uh, that's the level that you're operating on mm. and I think that delaying the delaying your entering into the working world first off if you do you're in industry yeah it's a year of work but if you can get it in the city where you're at uni you get to spend it with your other university flatmates that are yeah. still studying yeah. and you extend, you essentially extend your degree <clears throat> whilst not having to pay, whilst earning some really, really good money. You get to understand what the working world feels like. You have a bit of liberation and a bit of a break. Yeah. You're going to have to get back into academia, which is maybe not going to be so easy mm. because you've ungreased that groove of learning a little bit. But I think it's a, I think it's a really good idea. And I would, from my side, I mean, me and Darren, went to Carnage, uh, went to run Scotland um, Carnage for them. And BBC Radio Parliament featured us because they didn't like us at all. And we had to essentially flee the country. Wow. <laughs> but, uh, uh, so I found, do I found a couple of the quotes that I was looking for from this guy, Nate Schmidt. So he's a bit of a outlier because he quit college. So he set up a dropshipping company, was in business school. As soon as he made his first thousand dollars dropshipping, he was like, actually, why am I in business school now? And just left. So he says, I have a passionate hatred for modern business school. I paid thousands to learn nothing, nothing of value. Then I spent my free learning, free time learning copywriting online for free and started making more money than my professors in less than a year. Um, terrible ROI, college. Um, the, purpose, it, the purpose isn't fun, but it is a lot of fun to be there at least. Um, and where is it? Yeah, friend of mine, graduated with a business degree, 50k in student loans, applied to 40 jobs, entry level, didn't get a single one, moved back home, now taking real estate classes. Dude can't even get a 40k per year job with his degree, but yeah, definitely go to college. Um, take out thousands of student loans, learn how to follow rules, don't lead, get a job <laughs> building someone else's empire, mediocre pay, two weeks vacation, <laughs> cubicle, 40 hours a week, miserable, Slow have down, kid. Tell them to go to college. Tell them college Pump is the brakes. way. Repeat. Put the brakes, Yusuf. Like, like, don't let this be you. Stop it. You cast are going to be knocking down the door. <laughs> so I think, yeah, totally. I do get that. We've got to see both perspectives of that. No, like, that's someone who is really an outlier. Yeah. I, but I think what, what you can definitely take from that and what I think is a good thing to take away is don't be scared of changing your course. Like, You've only committed one year, and yeah, it's one big year. I think you have to read this one out because I'm not allowed to. No. <laughs> it's such a good one. Imagine a product that doesn't allow refunds, doesn't guarantee results, has dramatically increased in price, has dramatically decreased in value, encourages taking a massive debt if you can afford it. Debt is legally inescapable. This is called college. Wake up. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, if you're at university, you're doomed. 
There you go, yeah. And well, so all, all three Why of us. Why is this one hour and 20 minutes into the podcast? All, all three of us People started like, oh, the businesses that we have at university. So I'm, 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 the, I'm like number one of saying that university was, for me, a waste of time. The difference is I don't think it was a waste of money because it was £3,000 a year. I see. Like it's it and was. It's made you a, a different person, and I think like e- even if it doesn't get you a job at Ernst and Young, like it's not about that necessarily. It's about who who it's grown you into, and I think there's nobody saying that hedging your income and developing multiple sources of income is a bad thing, mm-hmm. regardless of what you end up studying or doing. I think don't be don't be scared of changing your course. If you get halfway through the year and you're like, right, I can't switch anymore. Right, okay, no, you can't. But you can bin that year. You've got your friends at uni. Switch to a course that you're going to like. Like but even now, universities I'm, will allow you to move internally without having to reapply as well. Yeah, like once I, you're in, you can. I, I I wish I still to this day wish that I'd done philosophy or psychology instead, and I knew at the time that that's where my passion lay. But I was um, I was very attached to the idea of a degree having a linear trajectory towards a profession. And my terrifying fear was if I do philosophy, mm, what, what job does that bring yeah. me into? And um, whereas should I, what I should have actually thought is what skills does it give me? Mm. And in terms of university, yeah, you may I didn't be paying. have anywhere near that level of foresight at 18. I was just like, no, I'm, me neither. I want to be a businessman. I'm going to do business. That was and me. It was like, what ended up reason. in a business. And I was like, oh, so what did, what did you all want to be when you started uni fuck knows probably a business yeah. owner which is what I actually ended up being mm. but one of the problems was I got to see very quickly so I did business management at undergrad very quickly I got to experience what running a real world business is like and doing club promo for all that it club promoters get accused of being glorified party boys you get to see from the ground floor you get a, a very very good cross section of everything from finances logistics operations marketing advertising HR you do everything and you're like right okay so each of the modules that I had at university I was going into a lecture and learning something then coming out looking at my phone and experiencing the real world Mm -hmm. and I was like what the fuck am I doing learning about Henry Ford's scientific model of management when everything that I'm experiencing in the real business world and I know it's the real business world because we're making thousands of pounds a year doing this business is showing me that it's useless. That, that was exactly my experience of a business degree. I did a module in entrepreneurship because I was like, you know what? Everything so far has been so dry and like op- operations research and p- linear programming and stuff that didn't have any... Kaizen. Idea. Yeah, it was like how Welsh's grape juice run their algorithms to allocate grapes from different sources to make the flavour the set. And it was like, this is completely irrelevant. So I was like, okay, module in entrepreneurship. And it was... It turned out to be history of entrepreneurship in the 1930s America. Oh, God. And I was like, this has told us nothing about... So... I think I think that anyone who's doing a business degree should be really, really cautious about it. Well, and suppose it's so actually, like, fucking the, popular. Because you're not going to have successful businessmen teaching you. They're not going to be lecturing you. It'll be academics that actually most likely don't have an ostensible business of their own by definition because they're not in a job that... Well, that's Anton. That's, that's yeah. Like, that is Anton. Most yeah. of these teachers are just... Fucking failures. <laughs> we'll link Say that on top. We'll link oh, no. the video. Um, maybe actually get rid of us and Anton will appear here. Bing. Back to school teachers. Obviously the vast majority work in the public sector. But even if you've been to a private school, it's very, very unlikely that any of these people have had a modicum of success anywhere in their life. So in terms of financial education, they can't teach you anything. Now we're back. <laughs> Three of us were sat in a room and Anton came in eating scrambled egg and toast. That was a plate. dream. In a bowl. Oh, okay. But yeah. that, actually, that's a really... I don't, are we wrapping up soon? We'll, get, we'll wrap up soon. Like, yeah. We need to do physical, don't we? Oh, of course. I would... I wish so much. And the, it, I don't feel like it was available as much then. Maybe that's just because I didn't, I didn't see any of it. But getting some kind of concurrent alternative education while I was at uni from oh. podcasts, books, YouTube. No. Well, I mean, so now like, people, people's capacity to be able to learn stuff. Like, do, do a couple of like, if you're doing 30 minutes of work a day, 
the minimum effective dose throughout your freshers year. And do 30 minutes of reading. Like, do, well. do, or enroll in like a Udemy course or like. And do a, not say that you have no time because most people read thousands of words a day, but it's from some news feed or yeah. like something completely asinine. Learn to code, so, learn to trade, learn copywriting. Those learn, three like, skills are so like, profitable. If you, if you have those, they're far more valuable than your degree and you're learning something else. Do it in your spare time. Like if this. if I was if I was back at uni, actually, the job that I would get if I didn't want to be a promoter, another job that I would do would be get funding to or use some of my student loan to get PT qualification, because I think that pretty much unqualified. I am aware that there is PT level three is a genuine qualification, and PTs out there, I apologise, mm. but it's a fucking couple of weeks course. Yeah, I think my most point, PTs so would, would agree that it is a terrible. My, my point is, that, and anyone who relies on their PT level three as like yeah. the source of their. But my, my point is that from from starting point to qualified, the takeoff is rapid. Get yourself a job at the gym group, and you're earning thirty five pounds an hour. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and you could be nineteen or twenty. Flexible as well, so you could do it. Thirty five pounds. Even now, <laughs> it blows my mind that PTs mm-hmm. get paid that much. It's fantastic. It's an unbelievable route to get into. And you go right, okay. I need to do what? Let's say I do ten hours, twenty hours a week. Like, okay, that's between three hundred and fifty and seven hundred pounds a week. Which of your uni mates? Any part time. Which of your yeah. uni mates? Just do bin your weekends. Bin your weekends for most of the time you're at uni. Work during the day. That is a good point, actually. I could have, like, we, I think we could have done that quite easily. Yeah, and, yeah. You just did, well. I mean, the gym, the pure gym, and all that stuff didn't exist. But yes, mm. yes, we could. I think. I mean, that's what a fantastic option for. Yeah. Doing so, gym. speaking of gym, yes, just thinking about this, and is Jim coming? It, I think he's he's on his way. Yeah. But video um, guy Jim, <laughs> video guy Jim. Um, yeah. So physical, yes, we've covered academic, social relationships financial yep physical you are between 18 and 25 there is no excuse for you to not be in good shape at that age you are a walking ball of steroids Mm. (laughs) so if you're if you're shapeless and skinny fat and untrained and you have the full capacity to train and you, you aren't you're wasting a huge dimension of your life and of your body and it only gets harder from then on in. And if you if you miss that window and you only start training when you're 30, when you think you've got more time, or when you're 40, you've missed on that window of potentially being able to build the base of a physique that you can carry for the rest of your life. That's a really good point. What's there's a um, there's a specific window, I think it's between the age of like 12 and 18, or is it 12 and 14 or something, which is when people make particular physical adaptations, then they're more pronounced later in life. And I've got to presume okay. that there's a tail off that will occur 18, 20, 21, et cetera, et cetera. But you're totally right. Like the fact that the, one of the only reasons I think that any of us are in good shape is the fact that we started training when we were 18 years old. Like I could never train again for the rest of my life. Go back Younger, in the gym. Actually for us. Yeah. Go, but... go, go back in the gym at 40 years old, 45 years old, spend six months in the gym. Let only be back, well. back in good nick. Yeah. Like you, you wouldn't, even just the time alone, but also the, the endocrine profile, the hormone profile that you had at the time was so conducive to muscle gain. And so the other mistake is like either not training at all or training, but constantly cutting, constantly yeah. trying to be Lean. shredded. Okay. So give me a very easy, I'm at university, I'm a girl or a guy. What's the split that I'm going to do? How am I going to train? So first off... This goes for girls as well. Don't think just in terms of muscle mass and whatever. It's like, yeah. Um, So so first off, I would say that a good opportunity to get around this, if you don't like the idea of training, if you're not into maybe training on your own, first off, get a training partner. That may help. Alternative would be start doing a sport. Like if you're playing netball, you'll have netball training. If you're doing rowing, you're going to get absolutely caned with some good conditioning work. Mm. Rugby's going to have some good S&C coaches in there. You're going to have a community of other people around you. But if you're not doing a sport like that, remembering that every uni's got books, fucking table tennis, badminton, like ultimate frisbee, whatever it is, there's something for you. But if you don't want to do that and you're going to go on to a training split, what's the suggestion? So... Get as lean as is reasonably practicable. So just like below 12% body fat. So like either... For a guy. Yeah, for abs. So for for a guy or a girl, abs almost showing is lean enough. If you're leaner, then great. And then just spend as much time as possible gaining muscle. Don't go (laughs) fulking, fat bulking. 
don't get your membership at the KFC club. Just eat a slight surplus. So you're gaining two to 300 grams a, a month for the whole of your degree. And if you really feel like you're spilling over with body fat, spend two or three weeks cutting and get back on. Before the your season again. abroad. Um, what, what are they doing in terms of training three days a week? Can I just add on to that an, an alternative? So if you do, if you're someone who's very visually focused, who isn't that bothered about, because I, I, ideally you're in a calorie surplus or maintenance the whole time. If you are going to cut, I would cut in third term. I cut when exams are on. Uh, so don't let it yeah. get in the way of the rest of you. So like... That was something we both did right, I think. Yeah. Which was dieting when exams were going on. It makes on. you more productive as well. Mm-hmm. And you, you're going to be at the library, you're distracted anyway. Term one, term two. So like starting uni now, just forget about body fat. Well, don't forget about it, but don't forget about cutting. Have two terms, like 20 weeks or longer of just built some muscle. And in the last term, if you want to diet for some holiday, do it then. Um, that's the alternative. But ideally, you'll see, I just think it's hard. As an 18 year old guy, you're extremely yeah, you, visually focused. Right. I think, and, I think that a lot of guys, or at least when I was at uni, a lot of guys were just concerned about being massive. Right. The biggest guy was the best guy. So, and so it's again, this kind like, of this race to hyper masculinity because no one's, no one is yet showing any outright signs of super masculinity because mm. you're all just basically big children. <laughs> this, this is the difficulty, isn't it? Because we're trying to give advice for the two sides. But yeah, for the people, because I know exactly the kind of person you mean that just tries to get massive. Mm. And a lot of the time they, they overshoot and they just get fat and they end up just looking oh, the, like the a girl, the girl that fat wants to remain, forearms. the girl that wants to re- try and get to a size four, like some <laughs> unbelievably tiny size. So they're just constantly on the stepping machine. Yeah. It's like, mm. I'm telling you now that guys will find you more attractive. You will be more healthy and you will enjoy the shape of your body more and it will be more sustainable for longer. And your maintenance calories will be higher if you've got a little bit of muscle mass. Muscle. And that does not mean that you actually look like you have muscle. It just means that you look like you have some shape to your body. Yeah. Um, my, yeah, again, I'm going to fly the flag for it. Ooh. Join a CrossFit box. Like, mm. I don't think, as someone at university, you're, so there's a, a, the gym where I go, I think a normal membership £79. A CrossFit membership now is £49. As a student, yes, £49 a month, that is expensive but you essentially have a PT seven days a week doing a class. Like if you're someone who's really into their athletics, consider... It's a small price to pay. Like I I think never shy away from investing in yourself, especially like a gym membership. £49 a month. Like you'd spend that in vodka easily. So yeah, you spend that on two nights out. Mm -hmm. Alternately, hire a coach. Mm -hmm. Hire a coach. I've just finished working with someone who's just finished uni. So he's been at uni for four and a half years. And he's just finished working. He's off to work somewhere exotic. But this before and after, he is a completely different person. Really? Massively different person. And he's, his his pers- perspective on it is like, it completely reshaped my... Because he, he, we've all experienced it. You go from being like, not that big, to being the person who is very big, big person. Yeah. And that impacts how you feel about yourself. Mm-hmm. And when you're going through that phase of your life, having that as a something to, to fall back on, yeah. like, I got this. I, like, so here's, that's great. here's something yeah. that, I, that I always used to think while I was at uni was I would never, ever miss a training session. And the reason that I wouldn't ever miss a training session was because I knew that if everything else in my life had gone backwards that day, because it's so turbulent, right? Mm. And we come back to the fact that you don't have a tremendously big sample of life to work with. Like almost every experience, especially when you've just moved away from home, everything's novel. You've never dealt with this before, so you have no idea of how to model what is going on. Mm. Like now, for me, it's very rare that I have a new experience. I'm like, I, everything is some version of something I've already dealt with. So I've got stuff Which they to think work. is why your life speeds up as you get older. Because it's, it's less awesome. than yeah. Gretchen Rubin, uh, The Happiness Project. You should check that out if you want to learn out more about how to extend your remembered self life through the use of novelty. Um, but yeah, I remember that I always used to train. So I was like, if I fucked it today and everything's gone wrong and I had an argument with the girlfriend that's back home and I this, that and the other, I know that I've got a good training session in and my body's progressed 0.01 of a percent. Um, mm-hmm. which is a nice way to do it. So any parting thoughts on how to survive university? Final thing on physical is to get a slow cooker or a rice cooker <laughs> or something um, because yeah. it just requires minimum um, competence at baking food. You can just put a bunch of frozen stuff in or whatever and it makes something that is passable as a meal and then you're not relying on like plain pasta or 
Domino's every day. And it's super cheap as well. Super, super cheap. Um, I actually got an email off someone asking if I was going to make that slow cooker Evernote public, and I now have. Uh, so if you want the slow cooker recipes, which are idiot proof, is in I can make them, and they're definitely uni student proof, give me an email. The email address is in the show notes, and I will send you the So Evernote. my rice cooker just broke of eight years. Instantly bought another one, like didn't. Make, didn't have a second thought. I, I tested the fuse first. Just <laughs> <laughs> oh, so there was a second thought. Well, I, know, I, I was I, like, I, oh, my rice cooker. I tried yeah. to perform CPR on it. Yeah. Didn't work. Yeah. Bought a new one. Um, parting thoughts on life at university. <laughs> try to not leave with a regret or try to minimise regrets. How do you know what you're going to regret? So I, I think there are it's a tough one but I think saying saying yes to as many things as you can like if there's something that's tempting and you find yourself saying no to something because like you're worried about oh, I need to do this assignment or like, I'm worried about my calories or whatever like things that went through my head when I was at uni just have as many new experiences as you can because it's like a period of, of life where ultimately I think probably all of us I feel like I went in like 18 year old kid and came out like I feel completely different now. Mm -hmm. So I think those experiences shape who you become. Mm -hmm. So breadth of experience is important, I think. Cool. Stop clinging on to what you think is safe or you will, all of those new experiences will completely pass you by. Yeah. Um, it is possible to pass your degree and enjoy every new experience that you want to. You're fully capable of doing that. You're the one in charge of your time. And if you use the tips we've discussed, you'll be able to do all of that and have a really full day um, and a really rich life experience in those three years or I think, four years. I think that's a really good way to put it. The, if I'd known, attempted the stuff that we've gone through today of how to organise my life or the fact that I shouldn't double down on any one set of experiences. So I became like big dick party boy. Like that was my thing. And it meant that I missed out on a lot of experiences that would have occurred during the day because I'd have thought, oh, well, like, I'm not going to go to the trip to Hadrian's Wall because, like, <laughs> that's rubbish. Like, no, like, I'm, like, I'll go out and get lashed with the lads. I'll, I'll day drink on Osborne Road from 11 a.m. when Spy Bar opens. Like, it's going to be just the same as when you day drank last week at 11 a.m. when Spy Bar See, that, opens. See, that's so insidious as well because if that's what you spend your week doing and the next week, very soon it's the end of the year, you've missed out on that richness of life experience and you have become a more boring, more basic person that is going to carry you for the rest of your life. Yeah, man. And so... It's, it's a slippery it's slope. Poor. So go so to Hadrian's Wall. Go, go, just go, go to Hadrian's Wall. Heaven's sake, for <laughs> bloody hell. And wear a condom while you're there. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. That's what this episode should be called. Wear a condom go while you're at Hadrian's Wall. wall. And wear a condom while you're there. <laughs> right. Right. Okay, bye then. Thank okay, you, bye, everyone. Dave. Bye.